Hey, what's up, guys? It's Ozzy here with the Crooked Cattle Podcast. Just wanted to do a quick little forward before we get into the podcast proper. Um, I think it's important that you listen to this segment uh, just to get some things out of the way. First off, for all the subscribers as well as uh, recurrent listeners who have been paying attention to our podcast recently, um, just letting you guys know we're switching from a uh, weekly schedule to a bi-weekly schedule. And the main reason is simply because... um, in fact, there's multiple reasons. Uh, first off, uh, as the post-production, the sole post-production guy who does all the editing, um, thumbnails, uh, SEO, all that stuff for the podcast and the episodes being uploaded and all that stuff, um, it does kind of leave me not as much time as I would like to be able to get certain things done. And because of that, it also leaves us not as much time to be able to prep these episodes as much as we could. And um, I actually discussed this with Trajan and he agreed. And um, in fact, uh, one of the things we're looking to do with future episodes is to be able to be more prepared with future episodes. And uh, I think this episode is a great example of why, Um, because uh, we could have prepared a little bit more for this episode. I feel I don't think it was a bad episode. I think it was good uh, just from my perspective, but take that as you will. Um, But because we were talking about the uh, situation on the Ukraine-Russo war going on, conflict, whatever you want to call it, um, looking back on it, there were certain details I ended up talking about that I feel maybe maybe I was not 100% accurate on because after re-listening to it, I wasn't 100% sure. And I did even more digging uh, and just kind of finding that some of the things I was saying maybe was not as accurate as I would have liked to have been. So I just want to say this as a warning, uh, just let you guys know, we are not politicians, we are not political scholars, we do not talk regularly about world events and uh, may not be as knowledgeable as some people who do dedicate all their time to this sort of thing. So if we do get certain things wrong, especially when talking about certain events going on currently, um, please take everything we say with a grain of salt. We are not perfect, we are humans and we do make mistakes and i just wanted to put that out there if you want to know the full context of what's going on and you want to know what is actually going on always do your diligence to do your research beforehand so anyways i'm sorry this has been going on a little long didn't mean for this to take three minutes i do apologize but anyways uh let's talk about war (laughs) and uh yeah, uh, viewer's discretion is advised also. So um, anyways, uh, here's episode 19 of the Crooked and Candle podcast. Thanks, guys. Welcome one and all. It is the Crook and Candle Podcast. This is episode 19. God, I was like slurring my speech there a little bit. Because it's not drunk. I'm not drunk, I swear. <laughs> I, I'm just marble mouthing my words. I do apologize. What's up, you guys? But hey, I hope you guys are doing good. Um, by the way, we're at 400 subscribers now. And over 20,000 on that Dino video. Views on the Dino. Yeah, it's crazy how much that video blew up. It, I'm still getting comment notifications for that video. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can have that happen for more of our other videos as well. Um, but uh, that being said, thank you to all the subscribers that are jumping on to the Crook and Candle ship. We really appreciate that. By the way, um, just as a quick aside uh, for the YouTube audience, because uh, I had noticed on the analytics that over 98% of people that were watching our videos are not subscribed. So if you're watching our videos, what the fuck are you doing? Subscribe to the channel, dude. Push the button. Hit the button, <laughs> the notification bell. If you're listening to this through the audio version, you don't have to worry about this. Um, you know, you're you're listening to this at your leisure. We do appreciate that regardless. All the same. Thank you guys for all the support and the good comments we've been getting. It uh, really means a lot. And uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, very, very humbling that we're we're seeing that growth still going up. Indeed. And um, yeah. So, anyways, we got an interesting topic today. Um, oh, but first, before we continue, how was your week? It was 
It was good. Busy. Yeah. Working hard. Um, yeah. Uh, just another week, really. Mm-hmm. Just busting my butt and busting my butt so much that my back was killing me. <laughs> but uh, I yeah. worked today as well. I think I get tomorrow off. Hope, hope. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was an all right week. I mean, outside of everything that's going on in the world. Yeah, which we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, you, your, your week, uh, it was okay. Um, though I actually, I talked to you about this earlier. I was, I was expecting to work on Thursday and then my job, which I've been already going back and forth on, you know, wanting to leave the job to do something else. And, um, on Thursday I, or Wednesday, I ended up pretty much get having that decision made for me. Yeah, because uh, because not enough hours. Yeah, yeah, not enough hours. I mean, it's enough that I'll be able to pay my rent and stuff, and I'm doing my best to not, you know, overly spend and stuff. In fact, that's why I ended up not going to the gym for two months, mm. so I can save on money. Um, but yeah, so Thursday, like Wednesday rolls around, literally, like I just get taken in by my manager, who's like, "Yeah, I was going to give you that Thursday, but uh, we just." We're not making enough money, which I think is bullshit because it's pretty busy over there, Mm. you know. So to me, I I just time to move on. Yeah, it just sounds like it's time to move on, and uh, I want to try to find. Careful, there we go. I want to try to find something that uh, that's not in the food industry, which that'll be interesting. Just trying to look around at this point, not trying to, you know, make a hasty decision, but I definitely want to, you know, choose carefully and uh take my time trying to find something else yeah. um but that's boring shit i know you guys don't want to hear that so i think it's time to segue onto the topic for today's episode which is when inspiration goes wild when mania motivation and how to oh mania motivation and how to stay focused uh focus on bipolar disorder man now nah, fuck that fuck that Fuck okay. that. We're not going to talk about that. You know what we're going to talk about? War. So, because it's on everyone's mind, I mean, the world's watching, and uh, yeah, that was the that was the initial one. I, I definitely that was wanna, the initial idea. Yeah, I wanted to. I definitely want to touch on that um, kind of mental illness and uh, art, mm-hmm. uh, but that I think we'll leave that for another day. Yeah, yeah, because uh, um, the whole the the thing in Ukraine is really yeah on a lot of people's minds. And for the record. Uh, just before we continue on, because because here's the thing, I I made it initially when I talked to you about this podcast. One of the things, one of the core tenets that I wanted was to stay apolitical. Yeah, not get yeah, not and, get. and that's still true. I don't want this to be a political channel because at the end of the day, that's t- to me, that's just not a lane I want to go down. I'm staying in my lane, which is art and creativity, but. The Ukraine situation, I think, is a little different because it is affecting pretty much every facet Mm -hmm. of life. And it's kind of you can't really avoid it, Mm -hmm. you know, even like with uh, video games, like um, you're seeing how that actually is affecting the landscape. And it's like and then on top of that, like because I have the I have Twitter and shit and I'm just seeing all these clips of like. (laughs) <laughs> fucking like war happening real time which is actually a, in fact there was a good comment that i saw on my twitter feed um i forget who said it but someone said something that was very poignant it's like we live in a very bizarre time where we have the ability to see a war happening near real time on our phones yeah yeah it used to not be that way no yeah before like because like for example um like the what the last major war to really happen what was world war two yeah World yeah, war that II. was the that was the last major like world shaping like 
yeah war and and that was the reason i started thinking about this is so as a painter myself i've i don't want to do overtly political artwork mm -hmm. okay um although uh like the singer nina simone uh she has said in an interview and, and it always touched me because i saw this clip a long time ago and this is during the Vietnam War and everything's going on. And she was like, you know, an artist's job is to reflect the things that are going on around them. And with everything that was going on, like, if, if not now, when? When do you say something about it? So I actually, the other day, I started thinking, I'm like, man, you know, I haven't experienced this, but I'm an artist. And I'm like trying, I'm thinking about, you know, there are artists <laughs> in Ukraine that are having to, to bail. Yeah. You know, I uh, watched a video on the, uh, the the Ukrainian museum and how they were having to pack up all these old paintings and, you know, and pieces of art because yeah. they're being invaded. Yeah. You know, and so that really got me thinking about artists. And, and I think I, I tended to look at painters because that's that's my wheelhouse um but artists of all types uh obviously are affected by this war that are that, you know they're ukrainian uh, artists dancers poets etc and so i started looking at artists during wartime and the thing that really popped up was all this post-war art uh around world war ii after world war ii sure and uh so I was really, I was really looking, you know, like, you know, what, and I, I, I don't think I took probably a deep enough dive into, you know, like painters that, that their subject matter is like war or conflict that's going on. Um, and, and I'm sh I'm sure there's gotta be some contemporary artists that take on, you know, these issues. Uh, but when I looked for it, it was, it was a lot of post World War II art. And, um, I just thought it was, it was very interesting, um, because I'm wondering what kind of art is going to be coming, you know, out of this whole conflict. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I think there's going to be a good amount of, you know, uh, media that's going to come out from this just cause, um. Yeah, because it's, it's like you can't avoid it. That, that is the major thing that is on people's minds right now. And uh, from a creative standpoint, I definitely think I definitely think there's a lot to be said. Um, and there's ways to kind of... In fact, it's kind of funny because I was thinking about this before we started. And um, because in the last podcast, where which, by the way, click in the corner if you want to listen to the last podcast uh, that we did with August. Uh, that was a really good episode if you missed that go check that out um and one of the things we ended up talking about and i i think i made a point about it where it was like some of the best stories and uh, or even just the some of the best pieces of media deal with pain and uh you know emotion emotions okay. and you know, really really hard you know hardships you know very difficult shit to talk about and what's one of the most difficult things to talk about war yeah for sure. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of stories. Yeah, I think Just, I remember mentioning, <laughs> I said, you know, like, though the, the hard things to deal with, the more painful things to deal with are the things that really stick out in our minds. Mm -hmm. You know, if you ask someone that, you know, was in love with someone, you say, well, when, what day did you did you fall in love? And, and the, they <laughs> they can't answer it. But if you say, what day, you know, what, when did you break up? They can remember the day, the, the hour even, you know, and yeah. what, what it looked like outside. And, you know, that, that heavy emotion is something that sticks with people, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, art or as being an artist, you know, and you're dealing with stuff that is just hurts your heart. Cause I know, uh, one of my paintings, which I had called War Child, and I decided just not to call it anything because I wanted to uh, have people 
look at the painting and, and come up with their own kind of interpretation of mm -hmm. it. But that that painting was taken from. Uh, I had actually seen uh, some footage of. I think it was um, Palestine, and they had just had a rocket attack from Israel, and there was some footage of these two little boys. They might have been like six and seven, and they're covered in dust and snot and tears and blood, and they're crying, and they were friends, and one of the kids had a brother that was a little bit older that died in the rocket attack, and they're just... And it hurt me so bad sure. to see that. And so out of that came the painting War Child, which uh, if you're watching the YouTube video, I'm, I'm sure we're going to pop it up for you to take a look at. Sure. Um, but it, it made me, anytime you talk about war and art, there's one piece of art that always pops up and is always used. And it's uh, Picasso's, Guernica. Yeah. And I think that was 1937. Let me see. I think that's about right. Yeah, 1937. Mm -hmm. This huge painting. And, uh, you know, the story goes that P Picasso was in in uh, Paris. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was doing his thing. He wasn't really getting involved. And <clears throat> then uh, I guess he had kind of got commissioned to do a painting. I can't remember or what it was it was probably some museum or something anyways um he was you know wondering what to paint and you know he didn't really have any good ideas but he started you know sketching and kind of coming up with something and then and this is world war ii so again it wasn't like the the town of guernica just got uh bombed and he knew about it immediately you know, as he was working out what he was going to paint, finally the story got to him of the bombing of Guernica by Italian and 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 German Nazi forces. Yeah, which was totally fucked up because one of the biggest things was uh, you know World War II. We had a lot of technical revolution, and when it came to the art of war, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, and so you know they had these new bombs and planes and they're like hey let's give this a test run <laughs> we're gonna go bomb this little town called guernica and the, the fucked up thing is when you look at the painting itself i think there's like three women in it one of them's holding a dead baby and then there is a soldier and he's kind of all blown apart but the reason why there was more there's all those women and the child is because most most of the men had been sent off to fight the war. Yeah. So they ended up bombing a town that was just kind of filled with women and children for the most part. Yeah. And uh, when, 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 you know, the news finally hit uh, and Picasso saw, you know, heard the story, he was so moved that he eventually painted this this painting Guernica, which is one of the greatest pieces of anti-war art ever mm -hmm. created. Yeah, and it has a good story to go along with it too, because um, once he finally painted it, um, there was a story where an SS officer visited him and saw the painting. And this is in it, Paris, because this was in Paris. Eventually, the Nazis ended up occupying going in, occupying Paris. Right. So, so an SS officer showed up saw his painting at his like, studio yeah at his studio and, and saw the painting was like oh this is really good did you do this and uh, picasso just looked at him he's like no sir you did yeah yep it's true mm -hmm. and uh yeah the funny thing is that when i when i looked at <clears throat> a couple of things when i looked at uh this post-war art that was coming out or even art that was being created during world war ii um, there was a, and I was inter I was like, wow, I did not know that. There was a lot of artists that were involved in the sur surrealist movement. Mm -hmm. Um, Dali created a painting that had to do with the war. Uh, you had Max Ernst. Let's see. Yeah, actually Max Ernst was like, he had fought in World War One. 
in the trenches. Mm -hmm. And he ended up, uh, you know, creating a paint, some paintings that were surrealist, but had to do with, with the war at the time. And then, uh, one of the most interesting stories was, uh, of the artist Andre Maison. Mm -hmm. And he had to, he was refugee. Um, yeah, he, he had actually, what does it say? Yeah. Yeah. Maison was, he had a, a Jewish wife and two like Jewish da daughters. Uh, he wasn't Jewish himself, but that's who he had married. And then because of his, his art and his kind of stance on, on world events, he was on all kinds of lists that the German had of, of decadent artists mm -hmm. that, you know, and, uh, he had to, to flee. Yeah. And he had to take his paintings with him, mm -hmm. you know, which I was like, I can't even imagine like, you're, you know, if there, if war broke out in Seattle and I'm like, uh, do I just leave and go to Canada or do I leave, but pack up all my paintings that I'm right. working, working on, you know, and the, the hardship of all that. Um, but yeah, it was very interesting that so many, uh, surrealists, we're, we're doing art ar around that time and, and talking about the, uh, the war. And one of the interests, I don't think you know this, but uh, Hitler, because he was a failed... Yeah, he was a painter. He was a, he was a failed artist. He actually tried to get into, uh, I think, the art school in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And he was turned down twice. Yeah. And uh, so he had a real problem with modern art. Mm -hmm. which he called degenerate and, and decadent. And eventually all of these artists <clears throat> uh, throughout Europe that as, as the Nazis were going through and taking over countries and stuff, you know, they would take the, this take art from artists and they would call, they actually had an art, f like fa not an art fair, but kind of a art ex ex exhibition, uh, it was the decadent art. No, uh, the not decadent. I just said it. Uh, oh God! My <laughs> Do you brain, have it written my down? brain's having a fart. <laughs> degenerate. Okay. It was called the G Degenerate Art Show. It was uh, held in Berlin, starting in July nineteenth, uh, nineteen uh, thirty-seven. So, mm -hmm. and that's it, why you you stay prepared. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think you remember. That. It's still early in the morning for yeah, me. Yeah, it's still pretty early. But yeah, they they actually took all this art from artists, and at that moment in time, there it was what was called modern art was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and artists were painting in different ways than had ever been. They weren't classically painting, and uh, the Nazis had this art show, and they had art like Nazi almost propagandist art. <laughs> <laughs> from the Nazis of like, oh, this is what beauty and real art is. And all this degenerate artists, all these liberal artists, this is crap. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is when you're, whenever you're dealing with <clears throat> a dictator, the first people that a dictator really goes after is artists intellectuals, teachers, writers. Yeah, writers. Uh, but anyone that's really in the liberal f arts field, which they're, they're creating art, because artists tend to be free thinkers. You yeah. know, they don't, they don't just go along with the party line or whatever is being said. And more often than not, they're, they're kind of outspoken and they don't just keep their mouth shut they they're like this is wrong and they start creating art around it and a dictator is like arrest these people mm -hmm. you know back on track um yeah it, it's uh, just going back to the ukraine thing like um one of the things that i was thinking about because like um because because that's the thing it's like um the reason why war is such a shitty thing is that it it really does it, it changes things really quickly and not in the ways you expect. Um, you know, just um, just in the Ukraine alone. For example, you, you know the the Metro games? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes, so yes. Th- that th- those games were made by Foray from um, the Ukraine, and um, in fact, there was another game that was being developed w- before the war broke out, uh, called uh, Stalker Two, which uh, which was based off of the Stalker series. I mentioned it before, but um, but yeah, very cult classic game, based in like this apocalyptic, like post Chernobyl area of the ukraine where there's all these like mutants and shit um anomalies and all that shit it's very interesting game and um that game was shaping up like literally like they had trailers out and it's like it looked great really in fact i'm gonna put some footage right here just so you guys can see what was being developed and then next thing you know news broke out about the fucking (laughs) russians coming in invading next thing you know everything stops yeah. Like, in fact, they ended up making like a video called Lights, Camera, War, um, where they were, they're like, yeah, we were about to show off like all these like behind the scenes of how we create our cutscenes, But then literally we had bombs, <laughs> you know, we were having cities being bombed yeah. and we had to stop everything. Had to pack up. Yeah. Well, not even pack up, like literally, because here's the thing, all the men that are able like they had to stay. Yeah, they picked the, up. Like most of the weapons. people that ended up having to leave mm-hmm. were women and children. And that's it. Although there is a lot of women that actually picked up arms. Oh yeah, sure. There there are yeah. definitely women that did pick up arms. Um, but for the most part, yeah. Most of the people that were leaving were women and children. And I get it. Absolutely. You know, it makes sense. Women and children first. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, because they're because they are important. Um and uh you And know, for the record I don't even like calling it a war. Yeah, it's well because yeah. you know I could you know wars break out when, you know, someone for example, I mean I I cuz to me it's just like a, a a conflict like Ukraine is fighting well they're defending oh, 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 their freedom. Oh, oh, yeah. Because someone's coming in. Yeah. They didn't do anything, you know, and that that should cause this to happen. Well, the fucked up thing about this too is that pretty much nobody wanted this. Mm-mm. Like nobody. Even and here's the thing, because there's been a lot more anti Russian sentiment, which I wouldn't go that far just because let's keep it real. Let's keep it a buck here. It's not, it's not the Russian people. It's not Russians are bad. No. And, and and unfortunately there's been a lot of people that have been trying to like, for example, like Facebook had this rule policy where they're like, Oh, we'll allow people to shit on Russian people (laughs) because, because of the war and all that stuff. And it's like, no, that's not, no, yeah. that's not the right thing to do. The last thing we want is to punish the people because that's because even like with all the sanctions that are going on, you know, in Russia, like the you know having all these companies pull out all these uh, payment. Oh, it's affecting, processors. It's affecting their it's economy. Effect, it's, and, a, it's not only just affecting their com- economy; it's affecting the people. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, this one channel, uh, No Fuckers, that's how uh, it's spelled: N F K R R Z. I think that's how it's mm. spelled, but. Um, I've been paying attention to this one guy because it's this Russian dude who speaks English, speaks English, who makes videos about Russia. This fucking dude had to leave Russia because literally like because he was making some good videos where he's like, this is what's going on over here. This is how it's affecting the people. And like literally like they the government made it so that if they have any sort of money in any and any other currency like U.S. dollars or uh, euros or anything like that, they are, have to be forced to to exchange their money to be, to the ruble. Yeah, yeah. And if you know anything about the ruble right now, it's fucking like worse. It's, it's less. It's less than a dollar. Yeah. It's less than the American dollar. Yeah. It's shit. Yeah. Their their economy is trash right now, and um, you know, you'll just see all these lines of people like at a fucking ATM. Like there, he had this video where he recorded where he went to a bank and fucking like security guards, like telling this line of people, like we don't have money <laughs> fucking go away. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you know, so it's really horrible shit. Like uh, there, and then like Ikea was pulling out and shit and you see this big line of people just rushing to Ikea to get their shit yeah. before the, they leave, you know, uh, fucking, what else like like shipping p- 
people like shipping companies mm -hmm. like they're refusing to go ship stuff from into russia yeah so yeah. you know so that's the thing it affects them too in fact that that's why whenever i've said anything about like outside of this channel like if i've ever talked about this i made sure to talk about the kremlin and putin because mm -hmm. it's because usually the people you should point to that just make things worse it's usually it's always the government yeah it always is the gov the government and the people that work for it are usually the people that are making these decisions and that's why it sucks you know because uh because even like the people in ukraine it's like nobody wanted this mm. like well a lot of people in 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 russia don't want this yeah and they made it to where you know there were people protesting and right now the people that have been arrested russian yeah. citizens in russia that are like we don't what are you doing they're facing 15 years yeah in a gulag yeah kind of thing you know and and it's it's really terrible you know i know like during world war ii the united states did not want to get involved in the war mm -hmm. you know and they're they're the populace was paying attention but it wasn't like americans were like let's go to war right you know let's let's get involved let's do this and uh it was pearl harbor happening sure that was where a big deal obviously most of the american people were like oh hell no time to take the gloves off let's go and the united yeah. states got involved in the war yeah um but you know this is just you know what's happening right now is just blind aggression and and you know you it it blows my mind i mean i understand dictatorships but it just it blows my mind that there can be a leader of a country and the the populace because people doesn't matter where you go doesn't matter what country you go to people always want the same thing they want to wake up make their coffee or tea take care of their kids send them to school or whatever and then go to work and you know work so they can bring home a paycheck so they can buy their food and take care and go out and see a movie and that's what they want. Yeah. That's you know, what they want. Pe people are in, and, and these are the people all over the world. You know, you, that's what Russian people want. They, I want to just live. Yeah. You know, and to have one fucking man who's can, can take this kind of action. It boggles my mind. It really does. Yeah. And the thing that it's kind of, well, it's not funny. I don't want to use the word funny because it's not funny. The thing that I've been noticing too, because like, because uh, I've been paying attention to this conflict since it started, like weeks ago, um, and one of the things that you were starting to see was like, um, now, granted, you, you definitely are seeing the Russian military like, like <laughs> sending cruise missiles to blow up fucking a bunch of buildings and residential areas and shit like that, and that's fucked up. But as far as like ground forces go, like I've been seeing a lot of like, like uh, stories of like the, you know, these fucking Russian foot soldiers, you know, getting ambushed and fucking like not you know, their morale being shit fucking. In fact, well, a lot kinda, of them have been taken captive or like, well, yeah, we, we didn't even want to fight. In, in fact, <laughs> in fact, there was a good amount of videos that were like, in fact, um, one of the things I, that I picked up on right away, was like, you would see these uh, videos of captive Russian soldiers and the people videoing them were obviously Ukrainian soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they're like, why did you invade? Why? And the story I heard a lot from many different Russian soldiers that were captive was we were told this was just a military exercise. We didn't even know we were going to be sent to fight you guys. We had no idea. Yeah. We, we didn't want this. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And it's just kind of painting this, fucked up picture where it's like even the people that are in the military the the soldiers the people doing the fighting they they didn't really want to be there and even to the point where it's like literally they're abandoning fucking tanks like uh vehicles shit like that um because you'll see those videos now now some people have been talking about like how you know is this because um pe there are people saying that oh it can't be that many you know, but the more I've been looking into it, it's it seems like there is a good amount of evidence to point that that the Russian military isn't necessarily 
in high spirits? Well, it was it, it, during Vietnam, which my father was in. Yeah. Um, there were stories of that happening yeah. with, with American troops. Oh, yeah. Like if you were uh, an officer, mm -hmm. it, which means you're you're in charge and you got a you know a battalion or whatever, a crew of guys, and you're like, yeah, let's we got to do this thing. It's like we got to take this hill, and it's like for what? What's there? Nothing. Yeah. And, and so, what would happen is like all of a sudden, the, you know, like the the crew would come back, and uh, someone would be like, "Well, where's where's the lieutenant, or where's the captain, or whatever?" Ah, uh, you know, he got blown up, right? But or shot, and a lot of times it was the American soldiers that were like, "You know what? Fuck this, pow." Let's go home. Right. You know, this is bullshit. Well, yeah. And that's the thing about the Vietnam War. It's like the thing that you, because like, um, because when they went into Vietnam, like this was the same US military that uh, got out of World War II and got out of the North Korean War. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was common with those wars was they were fighting uniform, uniformed people. Mm -hmm. You know, you can identify who the enemy is. Mm -hmm. But then, Next thing you know, oh, we're going to Vietnam, right? And so they're thinking it's going to be the same fucking thing. They're being trained like it's the same fucking thing. Like, oh, like World War II. Oh, it's fine. Don't worry. You take your M1 Grand and go fight those people in the jungle. Mm -hmm. But then next thing you know, you know, the, they're walking into a booby-trapped fucking jungle, fucking snipers in the fucking tree lines that you can't see tunnels you know fucking people <laughs> that look like citizens but they're not right and then next thing you know they just pull out an ak and blow you guys away yeah, yeah. like so and uh, in fact one of the uh speaking of um stories to come out of war one of the most fascinating stories which kind of shows how fucked up war is is the the meal eye massacre mm. and uh, i'm not going to go over all of it but there's actually a book. In fact, uh, actually, I would recommend you listen to another podcast. I'll link down below in the description uh, from the Jocko Willink podcast where he goes over the book. Uh, I think it was like four hours in me lie or something like that. Mm. And he basically goes over how a train unit can go from being happy and hopeful or oh, we're going to go in and we're going to liberate the people from the Viet Cong to literally massacring a whole village village of children women you know it, and it's, it was worse than that it wasn't just massacring like you know ass sexual assault yeah you know stuff like that um it was gnarly. It was a gnarly war, thing. War is monstrous and it breeds monsters. War, yeah, war is hell. Yeah. And um, and the thing is, too, like when you hear the story, it's like you might want to think like, oh, well, what the fuck? Fuck these soldiers. What's wrong with them? Why would they? Be? Well, here's the thing. When you hear the actual stories, it's like I could see how that would happen. Because in a way, it's like you're sending kids literal like like 18 year olds yeah most, the fight of, most war. of them had no idea why they're fighting a war yeah they had no idea they had no fucking clue like i mean they were you know given propaganda about you know you know communism and all that yeah. kind of shit you know trying to take over the you know the world and stuff like that and and don't get it twisted i i don't think communism is a good thing and there's pl plenty of evidence as to why um but it's not like it's not like Vietnam and the United States shared a border. Right, exactly. It was on the other side of the world. Right, yeah. And the, the, the thing about that war that was stupid is like, well, to be honest, we shouldn't have even been there. Been there. No. It, it shouldn't have happened. The only reason we got involved is because, well, we're America. We clearly were, we were the world police. Yeah. You know, we can we could take care of this, and we couldn't. Yeah. yeah. And, and it really came down to the fact that we just didn't understand what we were getting into. And... um Going back to the future for a bit, in fact, um, looking at the Ukraine war with uh, or war, whatever you want to call it, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and kind of how even like just seeing both sides of the story, because like just seeing seeing like how the, the Russians are dealing with this, especially the foot soldiers and how things are not necessarily maybe the best for them. Um, it kind of reminded me of because uh, I actually looked into uh, the Chechen War because uh, Russia back during the end of the USSR mm -hmm. 
ended up wanting to invade Chechnya. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, listening to the story on that, it was actually kind of funny because it's kind of it's kind of reminding me of the Ukraine Russian invasion thing. Yeah, because what happened with the Chechnyan war was literally they you had all of these people who were not necessarily uh you know weren't upkeeping with like maintaining for a war you know to, to be properly trained and they're just like hey you're going to invade chechnya and so they go in thinking they're, that the chechnyan people are just going to roll over because they thought oh well they're primitive they don't have the same kind of equipment they do no uh these guys were hardcore like they, they you, these Soviet troops come in, trying to just you know <laughs> blow shit up and fucking you know take over towns. Next thing you know, they're fucking being ambushed from all sides, fucking like being blown up, you know, booby traps, all that kind of shit. Fucking the Chechnyans were so hardcore. Like they would they would literally because like you would have um, the Soviet uh, army or or the post Soviet army, the USSR army whatever you want to call it um they were going in and having these fights and so they're calling like air support and fucking the chechens are like they they did this thing where they it's called hugging where they would get so in close on the the troops that if they wanted to bomb the chechens they were going to bomb they were going to them. bomb themselves mutually assured destruction yes exactly <laughs> wow and and yeah and it fucked with it got so bad that the the troops were like yeah like abandoned vehicles yeah. demoral demoralization they wouldn't shave they would stink they would they would run out of supplies like fucking if they wanted to radio like fucking these people the chechens had fucking radios too and they knew how to speak russian yeah so they would literally hear them trying to call in for support and they already knew what they were going to do yeah so and the reason why that happened was they just fucking had no clue yeah. They they just didn't respect the culture of Chechnya. They didn't understand the people, and so they ended up. It was one of the biggest fucking military disasters mm. ever. And in the case of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's not going the way they wanted. Like no. Putin was like, "Oh, we're gonna take over Kiev in like a few days." Yeah, still, still it's still there. Continues. Yeah. Now, granted, the, you know, cities are still getting bombed, and like even like before I came on the show, like one of the things. That I read because like uh, Twitter has a news thing, which I, I try to parse the news as much as I can and look into things on my own. But um, which but, is important, which is important to do because there's definitely misinformation, misinformation yeah. and stuff like that. So it's important to parse your information and look everywhere. But um, but like apparently, like uh, speaking of art, there was this uh, I think I don't know if it was in Mariupol. But there was this story that came out recently, just in a few hours, or in the morning, where there were residents holding up in this uh, art school that got fucking bombed. Mm. Hmm. You know, and it's like oh, there was there was uh, what was it? It was a uh, maternity ward. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. There yeah. was this fucked up picture. That came out of that where the maternity ward got bombed. And so they pull out this woman yeah. who's pregnant. And it's a great, I, I, I hate to say it like this, but it's a great photo. It's poignant. Because it, it, you could, like, literally, it's, it says a, a thousand words. Yeah, yeah. And it shows how fucked up it is. And unfortunately, the woman and her baby didn't make it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think the biggest reason I wanted to bring this up is because because the world's dealt with over the last couple of years hard 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 times sure um our world has changed uh due to the you know the pandemic that went is still here continues to go around mm -hmm. um and it it was almost like there there was a little bit of a silver lining coming out where it's like okay we got this vaccine and you know things are kind of getting back to normal even though there's this this pandemic still there this um but it just felt like things were gonna go back to 
the way it was. I can go out, I can see a movie, I can go to a show, I can, you know, and not worry about, you know, dying right. from, from a, a disease. So this on top of this war, this aggression on top of that, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about, oh, God, is this World War Three? Right. this and that, and which, you know, World War Two really started with one country. Yeah going into one other country and it kind of it just escalated yeah and uh so people are are worried i know just as an artist and i don't try to live in a bubble Mm -hmm. i don't try and live in a bubble i don't i i i feel that the art well i always say you know the art my art is me i'm the art I am art. Like I'm the art. When I actually paint something, it's an, you know, an outside expression of me, the art. Yeah. I am the art. Yeah. And uh because I don't live in a bubble, I tend to pay attention to things. Um I a painting I started a long time ago which I still haven't paint, uh, finished just because tattooing just is so much of my life. I really one day want like a year to just paint because uh, I always wonder what, what kind of output I would have and what, what kind of art would come out of me because, you know, I feel relatively talented, but I don't get to practice, you know, the art of painting as much as I, I would like to. But... You know, I, I definitely just think that because of the fact that I try not to live in a bubble and I try and pay attention to what's going on and I have con- like a lot of tattooing is having conversations with people, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of times I can sit there and it's a it's an hour tattoo and we I end up for two and a half, three hours with the client just having incredible conversations yeah. about life you know, the pandemic, uh, uh, politics, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, and, and I think this has been coming for me, uh, for a long time because I, well, I never went to art school one. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't, I don't paint enough to where I can say, this is my style. This is what you know, but I'd say over the last couple of years, I've, I've, my, my style has kind of morphed. I've always had this, well, not always, but I've had this idea of kind of taking figurative art and kind of, uh, uh, contemporary surrealist, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, expressionist, but, but mixing the two. And actually, the, the painting Warchild is a good example of that. And uh, this other painting that I hadn't, haven't finished yet, and I started it some years ago, uh, was called um, The the Refugees. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's these people, brown people, <laughs> and uh, they're behind barbed wire, and everyone's looking around and and discussing and you know um but there's this one child that this mother is holding and uh that's that's where the focus is is on the child because i really i have a real (sighs) compassion for children of course and and the reason being is i'm about to turn 51 and i've talked to you know other people that are older um than myself and we all agree you know like if you ever get to a point where you you think you know i think i need to get some therapy to work out this issue normally the issue is from when you were a kid yeah you know and the adults we have are the result of what happened to these innocent children Mm -hmm. and it, it just bums me out so much when i see you know, children of war, children of conflict, children that have to deal with their parents, like uh, having domestic issues and, you know, that kind of stuff. It really it really breaks my heart. Um, 
but I definitely feel like I've been moving more towards a style of painting that helps to tell a story uh, that, that, that isn't just pretty or aesthetic. Right. Um, which I did a lot of that. I, I, when I got into doing art originally, I was way into like Frank Frazetta and, uh, Boris Vallejo. I was very into like the, um, fantasy kind of illustration. Yeah. And when I was real young and I did that for a while, but eventually it was like, I, I'm like, I want to be a real, real painter. And, uh, I think that I'm, I'm the the paintings actually i just right over here i got a couple new canvases and uh i definitely want to do more art that revolves around you know there's a story in it it's not overt it's not something that says no war or but it shows you the emotion of uh, the painful emotion of living yeah and uh, actually to be quite honest i mean I, i've already you know, again i did a couple of paintings like this but you know, speaking with Dino, that was that was an incredible, uh, you know, conversation to have. Mm -hmm. And it really stuck with me when he said, you know, you know, bands don't want to talk about abused children or, you know, a kid that actually accidentally kills another kid because they're playing with a gun or, you know, uh, you know, they don't you, you you don't want to normally talk about these things. There's a lot of things in life where people try and push it to the side and pretend it doesn't happen. And he said, you know, I I we uh took some things that people don't want to talk about and and brought it into the conversation. Yeah. And that really stuck with me to where I'm like, you know, I I definitely want to create some artwork that deals more with the human condition and the things that we we go through as on a macro a micro level and a macro level because as far like for example if like this quote unquote war if if we're here and all of a sudden someone just kicks the door in right to our apartment and is like i'm taking over your apartment that's 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 what it is it's just yeah. you know which is just obviously wrong. I think this is definitely a war crime kind of thing. Yeah, you know, because what what the hell, man? You're you're just murdering people. Yeah, on a, on a larger scale, you know, and it's for no other reason than you're just aggressive, you know. And so, yeah, I hope that anyone listening to this episode, it's it's kind of heavy one because it's, yeah. it's on our it's on our minds, but you know, out of this and these kinds of conversations you know, great artwork is going to come from it because well, yeah. the, the stories are just so poignant. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's going to be a lot more pieces of art and music and even video games that are going to come out that are going to maybe not necessarily be just about this Ukraine situation, but definitely about, like, the effects in war, general war, war can hap have on the yeah. world. Yeah. And... um in that and it's kind of funny because like some of the some of my favorite pieces of uh media that i enjoy are pieces of media that do talk about things like that um in fact um wasp is a great example the band mm -hmm. wasp um in fact um he, uh, what was it headless children was a, a great album which did, dealt a lot about like war and uh nuclear war and stuff like that and and then uh, there was that one album, uh, "Dying for the World," which where he made that in response to the nine eleven attacks. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, the song "Hollowed Ground." He wrote that about because, like, he tells this. In fact, he, if you watch some of his interviews, um, he'll talk about it and say, like, "Yeah, literally, I went to New York um, a month before." That happened, and then I left, and I was going to come back for the World Series. That's when he got the news that the Twin Tower, and he lived in New York at one point. Mm. He doesn't live there now, but he used to. And so when he heard news about the towers falling, <laughs> he he was like, "I gotta go see that." Yeah, and um, and he talks about how that was like the most 
surreal experience you could have as a person is to see something that was there and, and it was gigantic it, gigantic <laughs> it, you would it, as a you could child never imagine it yeah ever just not, not being, being there. there and then and then you see this big fucking ground zero like the smell of dust and burnt wires and you know like you know just mm. just smoldering shit well, actually a lot of when, when i think about that's why it was hard a little bit harder to find painters dealing with war but out of war normally a lot of music comes oh, out. Oh yeah. Absolutely. You know, the sixties. Oh fuck. Like just there's a lot of music that we're talking about the fucking Vietnam War. Well, you had uh, like Metallica had the song One. Yeah. Uh these are just big bands. Megadeth. Uh Peace, the entirety Pe of Sabaton. Yeah. Pete Peace sells who's buying. Yeah, exactly. You know? So a lot of uh artists do take on this this topic because personally and I, I really do believe this. The majority of people don't want this. No, but yeah, it, you know, we're the the personally, it, and it sucks because I'm like, you know, because a certain country or a couple countries want to do things the way that they want to do them, suppress their populace, and you know, the leaders got all the money and wealth and da 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 da, da and then there's the people. Yeah. They're just kind of screwed, whether it's North Korea, China, you know, um, Russia, yeah, uh, anywhere where there's dictatorship. It's like, you know what, guys, if you guys would get over that shit and join a global community at this point in our history, the earth could be awesome if we were all working together. People could be, you know, our, our relationships with each other could be a lot better. Um, which is, I think what people would want, you know, now that isn't to say there's not, there's going to be a point where there's no conflict. It seems like it's a human condition. Yeah. There's, I don't think there's any avoiding it. Believe me, I would love for a world utopia, but the fact of the matter is there's something about humanity where we just crave conflict. Mm -hmm. We do. Why do we watch fuck? Why do hell? Why do I like to watch people fight like, in a cage yeah yeah <laughs> it's because it's there's something about it yeah it's built into us yeah yeah and e e even like regardless of how the ukraine situation goes i know there's going to be stories that come out about how brave the ukrainians were for sure like uh in fact just dude there's like like the thing that kind of got to me it made me go wow this is like for example um the klitschko brothers mm-hmm Vitaly and Vladimir Klitschko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I think Vladimir, I, I think he was already living there. He's like he was like a mayor. Yeah. And he's like, I'm not fucking leaving. I'm I'm gonna fight here. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna fight to the death if I have to. And then Vitaly came out. Yeah, I'm gonna fight fight to the death too. <laughs> like, yeah. and then uh, fucking uh, Alexander Yusik, another boxer, can you know who was like a world champion, went to fucking Ukraine because that's where he lived. Yeah. Fucking um. What's his name? He was also he was also from the Ukraine, but he was also a boxer. Um, fought uh, Triple G, and won the title from him. I forget his name. I, I should I'll put an annotation here on the screen. Um, but uh, but yeah, just seeing that, I'm like, wow, that that's that that's pretty heavy shit. You know, yeah. just just to, it, it, but it's also inspiring in a way. You know, to see these people not run they're like no this is our home we're gonna defend it you know yeah it's like don't you don't like don't just start a war but if if someone's bringing it to you yeah you but, gotta you gotta defend yourself yeah but and you're yeah. gonna have to fight yeah yeah and it's just what it is um but with that i because i gotta get ready gotta to go to work it. okay but um, thanks for listening to this one, you guys. It was, you know, it was kind of a little bit of a hard, sit, you know, conversation to have. Yeah, but and we didn't want this to be like a black pill kind of episode. Yeah. Like that—that's not what we want this to be because, because um, here's the thing: there's a lot, a lot of um, you have to deal with the darkness before you can see the light, and um, you know, it's definitely dark. What's going on? But I, I do think some good things will at least come from it. In fact, like, 
I'm gonna make this quick, but like, I think one of the things that's interesting is like how when all this shit went down, just to see the rest of the world be like, no, that's fucking bullshit, and kind of come together in a way. Like, I think that is a bit inspiring, and I'm hoping a lot of good can come from that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, personally, I I try to remain non-political and partisan yeah. and all that. But uh, you know, I definitely have. I stand with Ukraine. You know, I'm I'm against what what Putin is do- doing. Yeah. Um, and uh, for any of you out there, I you know I hope that you as well stand for peace. Um, and uh, yeah, stand against this tyranny. As the dude said, this aggression will not stand, <laughs> man. And with that, we're out. Thank you for listening to episode 19. Episode 19 of the Crook and Candle podcast. We will see you next week. And as always, real conversations and real artists. See you guys next week. Take it easy.